You're always a pawn when you're in the army. <laughs> you do what they tell you and you like it. <laughs> and, but the thing that, that I thought was uh, most important about it was that they did not tell me what to say or what to do. They, they, they did not give me any instructions other than to, just to catch the bus here and go there and come back. And, and I think that, that there had been a misunderstanding on that, and there was quite a f sense of feeling that the JCL was behind my thing, too, and I had nothing to do with the JCL at that time, and I hardly knew what they even stood for. I was still a, just a dirt farmer son out of Nebraska, and I had only a high school education, and I was not cut out for speaking or anything like that. It was just like all this was thrust onto me, so more or less because I had to been available <laughs> and came back early because I was back home already from the war from Europe when most of the guys were still thinking about enlisting or still going over. So they took advantage of me and <laughs> I had to, to go to these three camps, not by my, my choice. <laughs> the only uneasy incident that I had was when I spoke to the Fair Play group and they hissed at me. I was asked to speak, I guess, to this uh, Fair Play Committee group. And uh, I had been warned that they were quite militant and that uh, they were concerned for my safety, so they were going to put on some extra guards. I must have told them about some of my bombing missions, and at one time I made the statement that if they thought Japan was going to win the war, they're crazy, said that they're going to get bombed off of the map. And I heard some hissing and booing. <laughs> well, I didn't agree with them. They certainly had their their principles and their rights. I was born and raised in Nebraska, and it's quite different from what it was out in the West Coast. I don't think for a minute it was fair that the way they got locked up or in the tremendous losses that they suffered. I, my goodness, the life savings that people worked all their lives, and it wasn't right, it was a mistake. and. It, I don't know if I was in their shoes, I might have acted just like they did. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. and then again, I may not have. I would never know. I was supposed to testify for the government, but they never called me to testify. <laughs> I don't really know what I would have said. I certainly wouldn't have agreed with their stance, for sure. I see where I've been quoted quite a bit <laughs> as a result of it. <laughs> it's quoted as saying that those uh, resistors are fascists and that they're no good to their country and certainly were tearing down everything that I was trying to do. Today. Well, I think it was pretty strong stuff for me <laughs> if I wouldn't say that today. <laughs> but at the time, uh, in being young and gung-ho, you know, waving the flag, being patriotic as I was, I. I can understand why I said those things. I haven't been membership in JCL for quite a few years now. In fact, I, I've been pretty much living in seclusion. I, I really had to think twice about agreeing on this. Uh, I don't want to be criticized anymore for <laughs> what I've been, done or said so many years ago. Kind of bothers me because you know I. I felt that I fought my heart out to prove myself and everything, and I get criticized by. The resistors and some of the saved me. I see stories where they call me Inu, a dog, Baka, a fool, those things, and. It really hurts, you know. It would hurt. Uh, it would hurt me the most to. I guess that the resistors said that I didn't know what I was fighting for. And uh, kind of reminds me of an old saying that we had that on the way to the bombing target, we were flying for Uncle Sam. But the minute we dropped the bombs and we turned around, we were flying for ourselves. All we wanted to do was get back to base live another day. <laughs>